welcome. We had a little switch because we had somebody, a speaker's schedule change and they had to switch, but we have our Johnny on the spot, spot our Greenlee County Extension agent, this Mrs. Ashley Jeff for sample Mangus. <laughs> and we're going to do beef cattle EPD basics tonight and then talk a little bit about the opportunities in 4-H as well. And so you're going to have Ashley all night here, which is great. And you guys know the game. Thank you for all the people hopping in. And we already have another webinar link in the chat from our other Ashley, Question Wrangler, Ashley Wright, who's an agent in Cochise and Pima and which other one? Another county or two. Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz, okay. But you guys know the game. Here we go. We got the, oh, you got to switch. I'm like, I don't have control. <laughs> Give me a, there you go. Webinar etiquette. Of course, it is um, webinar. So you are muted, no camera, since it's learning experience. Q&A, if it's questions for Ashley, it will go in the Q&A box. And if it's a question you're asked, you'll throw your answer in the chat. Please clearly type them and we'll answer them when we can. And be patient and don't put them 17 times. But you guys know that by now because a lot of you guys have been on these things. We will have the recording available later. And of course, never harassment or anything else. Otherwise we have the right to remove you, but we haven't had to yet. Might have come a little bit close. <laughs> okay, Ashley, one more slide. And I think as of now, we have 15 people who have qualified for shirts. We are working with the printers to get it um, approved because of logos and all that stuff. So they are in process. And I think we have another eight or nine that might get one if they attend one more. And we'll still keep counting till we finish here. So live sessions, cool t-shirt. This is just a mock-up. We'll have to see what we can get, what the final one looks like, but I think it'll be pretty cool. So I'm gonna go ahead and let Ashley write, give back the screen, Ashley, Jeff for sample, bring her stuff up and we'll go ahead and get started. Awesome. Thanks, Betsy. Um, so as Betsy said, my name is Ashley Mingus, and I'm the 4-H agent in Greenlee County. And I'm really excited to be talking to you today about the basics of cattle EPDs, which there's a lot to learn. And so I'm going to try to give you just um, kind of a bird's eye view. And if you have any questions, make sure to put them in the Q&A and I'd be happy to ask. So my first question is, um, does anybody know what an EPD is before we get started? And I'm going to look and see if anybody in the chat has um, any idea what an EPD is, if they've ever seen EPDs, if they've ever heard anybody talk about EPDs. Looks like we got some chats going on about enter enterprise products. That's a good guess. Huh. Keep trying. I know we got some cowboys and girls on here. Yeah, I'm going to take a few more. Let's see if I can get one more. And if not, yeah, oh, we got a hint. Expected. That's your first hint. Let's see. See if I get one more. And if not, I'm going to go ahead and give it to you. All right, I'm going to go ahead. So it's expected progeny difference. And if we're going to dissect um, what that means, expected, it's a prediction. It's what we're predicting. Progeny, that's offspring, or in this case, we're talking about cattle, so calves and differences. So when you put that together, it's what we predict the differences of our calves are going to be. So it's a prediction of future offspring. And then it's a great way that we can um, value the genetics of an animal. Um, and it's how it's a prediction of expected um, differences in performance. This isn't the actual performance, but it gives us a really good idea. Um, you can compare animals of the same breed. So when we're using EPDs, 
um, we're looking at all Angus cattle or all Hereford cattle, um, all Charlotte cattle. We're comparing cattle of the same breed. And the, the best way to put it is it's the best guess of what calves will do. And so this is pretty much what we're looking at as you know the future of the animal ag industry because you can use EPDs for hogs and for lambs. And really it's helping producers um, get um, the genetics that they want and the genetics that are going to be the most profitable. So today we're going to talk about categories of EPDs in two categories. And we're going to talk about the basic ones um, and just give kind of an introduction to EPDs. We're going to talk about performance EPDs, which are broken down into growth and maternal EPDs. And then we're going to talk about carcass EPDs. So the growth and maternal EPDs that we're gonna talk about are the birth weight, the calving ease, weaning and yearling weight, and then maternal milk. Okay, so here's an example that you would see. You can use EPDs when you're trying to select a bull to breed your cows to. Um, you'll see EPDs used sometimes when you're livestock judging in a scenario. Um, where you'll judge the bulls both on paper and live evaluation. And so there's really a lot of real world application when talking about EPDs. So when you get a list of EPDs, what it'll usually do is it'll tell you what the EPD is, which you can see up here. Actually, I'm gonna use my little marker. Um, it's gonna tell you what the EPDs are in this area. And then it's gonna compare two or more animals. So here we have bull A and bull B. And then it's telling us the birth weight EPD. And these EPDs are being compared to the average for that breed. So in all of the scenarios that I'm gonna give, we're gonna talk about Angus cattle because that's where I tend to have a preference. So in, the, in this EPDs, we're com comparing birth weight of these two bulls to that of the Angus average, the Angus bull average. So birth weight is measured in pounds and it is the expected birth weight of the calves that this bull is gonna have. So this is the expected birth weight. So in this area, you'll see that there is a difference between bull A and bull B. Which bull do you think is gonna have heavier calves at birth? Bull A or bull B? Uh, hey, Ashley, just yeah. a quick question that I saw. Uh, come in. How do you know as they're answering, they, they say A, but how do you know if that's good or bad? Yeah, and we're going to talk about that. Awesome. That's a great question. Okay, so yep, so in this case, bull A looks like we're going to have a bigger, uh, a bigger calf at birth. And so when we're looking at EPDs, yep, it might depend on the cow's ability too. Yes, that's a really good point. And we're going to talk about that. So when we're looking at birth weight EPDs, and for all of our EPDs, you're gonna see here on the left side of these slides on what generally you're gonna want. And we're gonna want lower birth weight um, calves. And it depends on your scenario, but mostly across the board, you're looking for a lower birth weight because talking about this comment that was put in the chat by Kenzie, you wanna think about the cow's ability to have this calf. And so, the larger the birth weight, usually the more difficulty a cow is going to have um, out there on the range giving birth to a calf. And so you want to think a lot about your scenarios. So in Arizona, where we have a lot of open range and cattle are out in the middle of the desert giving um, birth to their calves, you are going to want this lower birth weight because that really does help um, with giving birth out there with limited resources. Yep, so in this case, bull B would be better because it's gonna have, um, it's predicted to have smaller calves at birth. Really good point. And we're gonna talk about another EPD that goes into um, cows giving birth. And so this one is called calving ease. Another um, point I wanna make before we continue on with calving ease is that you will see here the abbreviation when you're looking at um, these EPDs in a chart, usually they're abbreviated. So with um, birth weight, it's usually a BW. With calving ease, you're going to see CED for calving ease. 
um, index. I can't remember what the D stands for. That's my fault. But so these are going to be what you use when you're looking at the chart. So a calving ease EPD predicts the ease which calves are born for heifers. And yes, calving ease direct. Thank you, Ashley. So this is talking about unassisted births. So it's measured in percentages. So we are going to look for, let me switch back to my arrow. When we're talking about calving ease, we're gonna look for higher numbers because when looking at this scenario, we're say, saying that bull B had 5% more unassisted births. That's our prediction, that the calves that bull B is, is going to have is gonna have 5% more unassisted births. So we're gonna want cattle that have low birthing weights and have an easy time giving, um, giving birth to their calves. Okay. The next one we're gonna talk about is two different um, EPDs and that's weaning weight and yearling weight. So when you're looking for these on the chart, we're gonna look for WW when talking about weaning weight and YW when talking about yearling weight. And this is measured in pounds and it predicts what the weight of a calf is gonna be at weaning and at yearling age. And so we're comparing that to 205 days for weaning weight and 365 days for yearling weight. So why would this be important to ranchers? Why would it matter? Why would um, this EPD matter if you're a rancher? So I'm gonna wait for a few answers in the chat. Get those fingers typing, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, so if you own a ranch and you're selling your calves, why is it important what weaning weight and yearling weight is gonna be? Okay, <clears throat> next time for market. Yep, so we're talking about the market. Yep, everything is market driven. What else do we have? Any other guesses? Because they can control weight and, es and estimate and know the weight when sold. Yep, so it has a lot to do about when you're selling your calf crop. So if I'm selling my calf crop when, at weaning age, then I'm gonna look a lot at that weaning, weaning weight EPD. If I'm selling my calf crop at yearling weight, I'm gonna look a lot at that yearling weight EPD. So any guesses of when we're looking at this EPD on paper, are we gonna want a higher or a lower number? What do we think we're gonna want? I'm gonna wait for some. Honey, Emily, Emma, Gail, pop in here. John. That's right. We're gonna want a higher either yearling weight, weaning weight, depending on when we're selling, because the higher the weight, if we're selling um, by pound, that means the more dollars that's gonna be brought in. So perfect. Yep. So we're gonna want a higher number. So just, I'm just gonna stop and review as we go. So birthing weight, we're looking for, which are we looking for a lower or a higher? That's the first one we did. So birthing weight, I'm just gonna play a quick review game. Do we want lower? Yep, we want a lower birthing weight, perfect. Now, what about calving ease? Do we want a higher number or a lower number when we're talking about calving ease? Okay, lower is one of the guesses. What else, anybody else have a guess? Higher, yep, so we're gonna want a higher calving ease. Because remember, the higher the number, that means um, the higher the percent is that they're gonna have an easier time to give birth. Yep, so lower, higher, higher is right now what we've done. Perfect. Okay, now we're gonna talk about maternal milk. And this is gonna be um, the last one that we talked about in the performance area, so that growth and maternity um, EPDs. So this is gonna tell you um, the predicted milking ability of um, an animal's daughter. So when we're talking about Angus bulls, this is gonna um, tell us the milking ability of um, their heifer calves. And a lot of times um, milk can be associated with additional pounds um, for your calf when weaned. 
And this is really important when we're talking about um, selecting replacement heifers. Does anybody know what a replacement heifer is? If you can put that in the chat too. When I'm saying I have replacement heifers, what does that really, what does that mean? If anybody has any guesses. I'm gonna wait for at least one. That's what I'm gonna do for all of my questions. I'm gonna wait for at least one guess and then I'll move on to the next one. Okay. A cow nurse has another calf in case one gets lost. Okay, so being in a place for when the cows are no longer producing. Okay, perfect. So being in place when the cows are no longer producing, that is a great way um, to explain it. So when you are on a ranch and your cows are starting to get older, what you're gonna do is you're gonna keep some of your heifer calves, the ones that you think have really good genetics, and are gonna do really well on your operation, you're gonna keep those calves to replace your cows that are no longer producing. So that's why we call them replacement heifers. So when we're looking at maternal milk, this can be helpful when we're talking about replacement heifers, but sometimes more milk is not necessarily better. And the reason for that is because um, cows that are heavier milkers tend to need more resources. And by resources, I mean, mean feed, water, they tend to need um, more of that in order to produce more milk. So when we're in Arizona, do we think that having heavier milkers is a good thing for us? Do we want heavier milkers here in Arizona? No, we don't. You know, maybe somewhere that you're on, you know, a small farm where you have um, cows in pasture, you have a lot of feed and water resources, then that might be an area where you would want a heavy milker, you wouldn't think twice. But in Arizona, where we're running cattle out here on these, um, you know, desert ranches, we're not going to want a heavy milker. So then that leads to my next question, which we've kind of talked about is when we're looking at the maternal milk EPDs, are we going to want a high number? Or are we going to want a low number? And we're talking about this from an Arizona standpoint. What are we going to want when we're looking at these maternal milk EPDs? High or low? Nope. Yep. So we don't want he heavy milkers in Arizona. We want a low to moderate number. So that's what we're going to look for when we're looking for that maternal EPD is lower and more moderate. So the next section we're going to talk about is going to be the carcass EPDs. And these carcass EPDs um, come from slaughtered um, data and ultrasound data in order to give the best prediction that they can. And so the three that we're going to talk about, and these are not the only carcass EPDs out there, but just the basics that we're going to get introduced to today are carcass weight, ribeye area, and marbling. So our first one is carcass weight. And carcass weight is measured in pounds and it's the total amount of retail product of a carcass, but it's not necessarily an indicator of quality, but it just gives you an idea of when this, when this you know, um, yearling is sold after the feedlot and it heads to the slaughterhouse, this is an idea of what the prediction is gonna be for the carcass weight. So when we're looking at this EPD, what do you think we, we would want? Would we want a higher um, carcass weight EPD or a lower carcass weight EPD? What guesses do we have here? Okay, yeah, we're gonna want a higher carcass weight EPD. So we're gonna look for a, car a carcass weight that is higher because again, we're thinking about pounds of product. As a rancher, we're, we're, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for those pounds of product. Um, so in this case, which bull would have a higher um, carcass weight EPD? Yep, bull A. And then just a reminder as we're going through here, carcass weight is usually written as CW. I'm going to go back really quick and remind you, maternal milk is usually written as milk. And then I told you about yearling weight. But just want to remind you those, because when you see them in a graphic, it'll usually just say CW here, and I want to give you an idea of what those are. Yep, so we're going to want a higher EPD in carcass weight, and in this case, bull A is going to have that higher EPD in that area. Oh, no. 
let me fix my ooh, ooh. all right so the graphic here doesn't match but the marbling is still the same so marbling is measured in percent and what it is it's the marbling score of the carcass it's a really important carcass trait and it actually is one of the most heritable so what does that mean when i say it's one of the most heritable does anybody have any guesses on what that means get passed down mm -hmm. so in terms of one of the most heritable this is one that um, has the most accuracy when we're passing it down from generation to generation so marbling is a really important carcass trait. So when we're looking at marbling, what guesses do we have? And if you were paying attention a little bit earlier, I might've given it away, but what guesses do we have for if we want a higher or a lower marbling score? Okay, we have a guess for lower, any other guesses? Yep, higher for flavor because marbling is, re is really important. There's a lot of things when you're talking about the quality of meat in terms um, in terms of uh, beef. You know, we're talking about their yield grade. We're talking about marbling. There's a lot of different factors that go into it. But yep, we want a higher marbling EPD because that's going to lead to a higher quality um, meat cut. Hey, hey, Ashley, got a question that came in. How do you decide if you want to select a bull for maternal traits or carcass traits? Yeah, so we are going to talk about that a little bit later, but that's a really good question. So in when using EPDs, whether it's for actual production, you know, from the rancher's standpoint, or whether it's for um, a competition like livestock judging, what you're going to do is you're going to evaluate the scenario. So for example, like we talked about with milk, our scenario is that we live in Arizona with pretty scarce resources. And I keep looking outside, which I realize isn't very applicable for the Zoom, but we live in Arizona for, with really scarce resources. So that gives us an idea for um, that milk EPD. When we're talking about um, carcass EPDs, we're gonna think about um, who our rancher is selling to, um, when they're retaining ownership, if they're trying to be in um, those programs that pay for um, quality, different things like that. When we're looking at a more maternal traits, we want to look for, are they keeping replacement heifers? Like what's the purpose of the ranch? Are they keeping replacement heifers? Are they selling for terminal? And that'll give us an idea of what traits are more important. And I'm not sure if that answered your question. And if there's a follow-up, feel free. Yeah, and there was a quick question too. Would marbling, what would marbling have to do with flavor? I think, didn't we learn that from Sam last time? Oops, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, yeah, we did learn that from Sam, and it has to do with tenderness. So um, the higher the marbling, the, the more tender um, your piece of meat, your meat is, which usually, um, sells for a higher cost. And if Ashley or Betsy wants to jump in and, and summarize that any better, but yep. So marbling, higher marbling equals more tenderness, equals better flavor, equals- I was gonna say good flavor. Yes, really good flavor. Okay, so we're gonna head on to the next one, which is your ribeye area. So when you look at this um, on your, when you look at this on your table, you're gonna see a REA or an RE. And here we go, we have marbling and ribeye area included in this one. It's measured in square inches. So when you think of a ribeye area, think about the ribeye steak and think about the, you know, the bigger, you want a bigger steak. So you want a bigger ribeye area. And so bulls with larger ribeye area EPDs are predicted to, um, to sire calves that will have more muscle and then a higher percent of carcass retail product. So if bulls with larger ribeye areas are gonna have calves that have more muscle and more pounds in, of carcass, then what do you think we're gonna want when we're looking at ribeye area? Lower or higher? Yep, we're gonna want bigger. Yep, so are we gonna want higher or lower numbers? 
That's right. When we're looking at the ribeye area APD, we're going to look for those higher numbers. Okay, so now we're going to practice a little bit. I have a few questions for you that I'm that I want you to answer in the chat. Okay, so my first question would be, um, which bull, which bull's calves will weigh more at birth, bull A or bull B? So which bull's calves will weigh more at birth? All right, let's see the chat blow up with A or B for birth weight. Okay, so we have a B, we have a B. I'm gonna wait until I get the majority of answers in. Oh, okay. Liz, Kiana, Kenzie, Kaylee. We've got lots of K's tonight. Josephine, John, Gail, Emma, Emily, Connie, and our phone caller probably can't answer. Yeah. No, okay. So it looks like we have some B's in here. Full B. Okay. And yep, that is the correct answer. Full B. And the reason, okay, so we're looking at BW. We're looking here at birth weight. Oh, and then we're going to look here and bull A is below average. So we're having a below average birth weight and bull B is um, 0.1 above average. So, so bull, bull B will be having, um, or is predicted to have calves with a higher birth weight. Okay, my next question for you is, and you might need a calculator or a pen and paper to do this, or maybe you're smarter than me and you can do it in your head. Um, but how much more will bull B's calves weigh at weaning? So how much more, oh no, will bull B's calves weigh at weaning? You shouldn't need a calculator for this one. I mean bull, okay, 11. <laughs> Answer. <laughs> yeah, I meant the yearling weight I had, and I'm sorry, and that's bull A's calves. How much more will bull A's calves weigh than bull B? I got my two questions mixed up and I apologize for that. Okay, so we do have 11. So that was at weaning, 50 pounds more we have. 11, we're gonna wait for a few more. So how much, and I'll repeat the question because I kind of got us all confused and I apologize for that, that's what I get. Um, how much more will bull A's calves weigh at weaning? How much more will bull bull's a, bull A's calves weigh at weaning? Man, I'm having some tongue twister problems tonight. Okay, so we have some 11, 60 pounds, 11. Okay, so we're gonna look here at weaning weight and they're both above average. So bull, a is 61 pounds above average. Well, B is 50 pounds above average is the expected. In this case, bull A, um, our, expect, our expected prediction is that it'll be 11 pounds. Calves at weaning will be 11 pounds heavier than bull B. Okay, my next question is, in Arizona, which cow or which bull do you expect to, to produce calves that would need less resources? So which one would you expect to need less resources? Okay, let's so see, I'm not seeing answers. Okay, there we go, B, okay, A. So when we we're talking about less resources last time, we were thinking about milk production. That's kind of where I would go. So we have B and A, any other guesses? I need at least one more because right now I have them tied. So I need to see whatever what the consensus is. B. And B is the winner. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Okay, so in this case, if I'm looking at milk and we had said when talking about milk, we want lower EPDs because of the fact that we live in Arizona. So in this case, bull A would have a, a more ideal EPD because I'm expecting that the heifers, the heifers that bull A produces 
will produce less milk, which means they will need less feed and water resources. So in this case, when talking about um, resources needed, I'm looking at bull A. And these are, again, really small assumptions and you never pick, um, and my husband just reminded me that of this today while I was making the presentation, but you never um, select cattle based on just one trait. It's never just based on one trait. You have to look at them across the board. But these questions I'm asking you are to get you thinking about um, which traits are um, important when looking at different scenarios. Okay. So my next so, question, yeah, sorry, go ahead. So I got a quick question because you kind of skipped over yearling weight. So if that, if the bull A produces cows that make less milk, but they have bigger yearling weights. Yeah, that's a really good point. Because that one bull B produces, if it's one cow and one cow, bull B produces 21 plus 21 but then has smaller yearling weights. Yeah, so um, I think the point that Betsy's trying to make that's good to highlight here is that even though the heifers from bull A are producing less milk, they're still having heavier calves at, at weaning. Their weaning weight is still higher. So you're having a really well-producing cow. She's, she um, is needing less resources, but she's still producing um, a heavier calf, both at weaning and at yearling weight. Is that kind of the point you were hoping to highlight there, Betsy? Yeah, well, and so even with less milk production, so she'll do better, her calves are doing better both at weanling, weaning and yearling. Yeah, and she's, if we're, if we're looking at, and these are the heifers that are gonna come out of boy, if we're looking at the, out of the at the heifers and the cows that are going to come out of bull a um it's ideal because whether we're selling at weaning weight or we're selling at yearling weight um both of those weights are higher with bull a okay cool. my last question on this practice session is going to be which bull has a better Ribeye area EPD. So which bull has a better ribeye area EPD? Okay, I'm gonna wait for a few answers in there. Okay, so we have a lot of Bs and that's where I'd go. That's right, because when we're looking at ribeye area, we are going to want to look for a higher ribeye area EPD. So when we're comparing these two, we're looking at this higher rib, ribeye EPD. Okay, so now the thing that we're going to think of when we're looking at these um, two practice, practice bulls. So my question for you is, if I want to pick a bull out of these two, two that I'm going to bring back home to my Arizona ranch, and I'm going to use to breed to my cows and keep replacement heifers. So what I really care about in this, in this scenario is that I'm going to keep all of those heifer calves as replacements. So I'm looking at a lot of maternal traits. Who do you think I'm going to keep? And this is, okay, let's put some guesses in there. A, 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 we have a few A's. All right, for two more guesses. And then I'm going to ask a follow-up. A. Okay, you should keep A. Okay, so can I'm just going to look for two people to answer this question. Why? Why do you think we should keep A? Any thoughts? Lower cost. A good weaning weight. Okay, there was the two. I did say two. I was going to wait and see if anybody else, but I better keep my word. Yep. So in this case, if I'm looking for a bull that I'm going to bring home, um, yep. Okay. Good point, Ashley. And I'll hit on that. Okay. So if I'm looking for a bull that I'm going to bring home and raise, um, raise replacement heifers out of, and I'm wanting to look for those maternal qualities, I'm going to bring home bull A because she needs less resources. Um, she's going to have, 
uh, lower birthing weight. So I'm thinking of my calving ease in, in this area. And she does have a higher weaning and yearling weight if I do sell those calves for terminal um, reasons. And so I do wanna hit on what Ashley um, had said in the chat is that just a reminder that these EPDs are compared to the average for the breed. So in this case, we're using um, Angus. Angus is the breed that we're using here in comparison. So even though bull A's expected heifers are gonna have a lower uh, milk EPD, it's still higher than the average. So when it's plus 15, that means you know plus 15 above average. When it's minus one, that's minus one above average. But I do wanna make that point. So yep, so in this case, sorry, the sun's bright in my eyes. In this case, we're gonna keep bull A. Um, in order to have replacement heifers out of him. All right, so we're gonna move on to now a practice, another practice session. So pick your bull is what the next portion of this presentation is going to be. So here's the scenario and we're gonna walk through it a little bit together. And it's a lot of words, but we're gonna dissect it um, after we get through it. So we're gonna rank these next four bulls um, to be used on a commercial Angus operation in southeastern Arizona, feed and labor resources are scarce. The ranch retains ownership on 20% of the yearlings in the feedlot in order to capitalize on choice and prime premiums. And the majority of the calves are sold as yearlings. So that is a lot a lot of stuff to keep in mind. So now let's dissect that a little bit. The first hint that's kind of given to us um, talking about what's important um, for this scenario is the fact that we're in Southeastern Arizona and fate, um, feed and labor resources are scarce. So what EPDs do you think we're gonna be kind of keeping in mind when we're thinking about feed and labor resources being scarce and being out here in um, Southeastern Arizona? What EPDs, milk, yep. Milk is a great one because we're thinking about um, the lack of, or not having as, as much feed resources. What else do you think? If we're having, if we have, yep, ease of birth, exactly. And then one more I'm looking for that's related to um, calving ease. So we have milk, we have calving ease. Is there one more that we can think of that's related to calving ease? The other one we're gonna look at is also birthing weight, but those are great. You guys are, it's making me kind of happy because I feel like we're, we're jamming. But yep, so if we're gonna have um, scarce resources and feed, we're thinking about our milk EPD. And if we're gonna have, you know, scarce resources in terms of labor, and by that, it means that, you know, a cowboy is not at every single section of the ranch all the time. So these cattle are gonna have to um, have, they're gonna to have to birth on their own. There's not gonna be any pulling of calves. So we're gonna look at that calving ease and that birth weight EPD. Good, so those are some things we're gonna keep in mind. And just a reminder, when we're looking at the birth weight EPD, we're gonna want lower numbers. Um, when we're looking at calving ease, we're gonna want higher numbers and milk, we're gonna want lower numbers. Just kind of trying to give you all of that before we look at the numbers. Okay, so the next question I have, and this one is, is pretty big, is that, the ranch is going to keep, you know, a percent ownership of these yearlings and they're going to want to try to make money on choice and prime premium. So this has to do a lot um, with the, the beef cuts of the yearlings that they sell. So what EPDs do you think that we're going to look at in terms of this area of the question? So I'm going to say, so we're selling um, yearlings. So we're, that's a point to keep in mind. And we want to make money on a lot of the different um, EPDs that have to do with carcass. So what EPDs are we going to, are we going to look at when we're thinking about this portion of the scenario? Okay. Yearling weight is one of them. Ribeye area, marbling, yep, okay, perfect, yes. So we're gonna wanna look at our yearling weight. That's gonna be um, important to us because 
as our next section is going to talk about, you know, a majority of these calves are sold as yearlings. So for us, the higher the yearling weight is, the more money that's going to bring into the rancher. And then um, for the yearlings that the rancher has some ownership in, they're selling them for a lot of these um, choice and prime premiums. So we're going to look at marbling and ribeye area, and we're going to look at that carcass weight. Perfect. So it's going to be a lot of traits across the board, but like I said, you don't ever want to select just on one EPD trait. We're going to look across the board and we want to pick um, the animal that we think is the overall best. Okay, so with that being said, the next slide is going to be a lot of numbers, but it's going to be for you to decipher. Okay, so on this slide, you will see that there's four different bulls. So bull one, bull two, bull three, and bull four. And it gives you a list of all of their EPDs. So I'm going to go through um, them just in case you don't remember what each one means. So CED, actually, I'm going to look and see. So this one, CED, is calving ease. Then we're going to have birth weight, weaning weight, yearling weight, our milk EPD, maternal milk EPD, ribeye area, our marbling EPD, and our carcass weight. So I'm going to give everybody five minutes to look at the scenario. And I want you to tell me there's two bulls that stand out in this um, scenario to me. So I want you to tell me which bull you would keep. So which bull would you bring home to your Southeastern Arizona production where you don't have a lot of feed and labor resources? You're selling your calves at year when they're yearlings, and you care a lot about trying to get those um, those premiums for prime. So those are the four things we're looking at: Arizona yearlings, prime. Actually, that'll be our three. So I'm going to give everybody five minutes to look these over and tell me which bull they're going to want to keep. I know, I, I need to play some, some music. <laughs> yeah, and tell us why. Thanks, Ashley, for adding that in there. And make sure to tell us why. And the fun part about this, while everybody fills it out so I can fill, you know, um, the silence, is... This scenario is actually a true scenario. My husband um, wrote it up um, and it mirrors the ranch that my husband runs with his family. And two of these bulls EPDs are actually true, um, true bulls. They're real EPDs. And one of them, my husband um, gets his semen to AI our cattle. So this is all stuff that's happening in the real world and that is making a difference for producers and for ranchers. So it's really fun. And he's sitting over here to my left. So sometimes when I like looked off to the screen and was like, what do you think? That's, I was asking my cattle expert over here to the left. Okay, let's see. Okay. So we have a few guesses in here. Some of our guesses are bull one. Okay, I'm gonna write down some of our guesses so we have an idea of what um, the consensus is. Is bull one, we have a bull four, we have a bull one. And Kenzie is saying milk and by area. Okay, I'm still missing a few guesses. So if we could put our guesses in there, which bull would you pick to keep on your ranch in Arizona where you're selling your calves at yearling age and you care about different premiums associated with carcasses? I'm still waiting for a few. Okay, let's see. Okay, I'm trying to see how many people I had guessed. If I can get at least 
seven people to put their guests into the chat, then I'll tell you why. So I have one, two, three. five, six, seven. Okay, look at that. Okay, so, and I'm gonna put how I would place it in here with them in order. And then I'm gonna tell you why. Okay, so the way, and when I say I would place it, I really actually mean my husband. The way my husband would place it is um, one, three, two, four. But if you look at these, um, Fools, I think that it really does break up into um, two pairs. So we have a top pair of bulls that are really similar, that are two really good bulls when you look at them on paper, and that's bull one and bull three. So I think if you picked either of those bulls, they're very similar. They're gonna do a really good job when you bring them home um, to your ranch. And then I think that the other two bulls kind of just fall short and that's bull two and bull four. But a lot of the things that you guys said in here, and I just wanna look over some of the comments are really on the money. So we looked at milk production. You know, we don't want um, something that's producing extremely above average. Like I said, we either want low or moderate. And in this case, um, the two bulls that are lower or more moderate, there's our five minute timer, are um, bull one and bull three. And then um, some of you also talked about yearling weight. And so exactly, we're gonna sell a majority of our calves um, at that yearling age mark. So the more pounds that they have, that's the more money we're bringing in. So in this case, the ones that you know come to the top in terms of um, yearling weight are bull one and bull three. And so the other thing that we talked about in terms of not having enough resources aside from milk is that calving ease and that birth weight. Because when you're out here where we are, um, there's, there's a low probability that you're gonna be there every time um, a heifer is having a calf for the first time. So we wanna make sure that she's not gonna have a lot of problems. So we're gonna look at um, calving ease and birth weight. And so when you look at these, um, the two that stand out in terms of calving ease are bull one and bull three. And in terms of birth weight, the lower birth weight bulls are bull one and bull three. So a lot of the time these bull one, bull, bull one and bull three have a lot of those similar, um, similar EPDs. And then the other thing, oops, I'm so sorry. I went ahead one to my slides. The other thing that we're going to look at is those carcass traits, because for those yearlings that um, the ranch still has some ownership in, they're getting a lot more money for the premiums um, for those um, better carcasses. So we're looking again at these carcass EPDs and the same thing here is um, bull one and bull three kind of come to the top. But I think bull one really sets himself apart when you're looking at that yearling weight, um, when you're looking at that ribeye area um, and his marbling score. Overall, he just comes up just a little bit better. And then in real life, um, he's a bull by the name of Treasure, and bull three is actually his grandfather. So those are some um, actual bulls that we're using some semen on here on the ranch. And so I think that was a kind of fun um, scenario to make it really applicable. Now, are there any questions about EPDs before I share my next um, presentation, which is about the opportunity, how you can use this, like how can I use EPDs in my 4-H project? And I can always come back if there are any questions. Okay, I'm going to switch my slides really quick. Yes, say hey, they've, you've been keeping them hopping. They haven't had time to type too many questions. That's great. Good, good. I wanted to try to make it a little more, not like, I guess we're yes. fine. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> let's see. All right. And so, oops, 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 oops. Let's start here. Okay. And so the last part I'm going to talk about is how are we going to use these EPDs in Arizona 4-H? One part I want to hit on again is that EPDs are not just for cattle. And that's why you'll see a swine picture here. EPDs can be used with hogs, can be used with lambs. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit more about that. So how can I take these EPDs 
and use it in my project. So what you can do is you can learn how to expand your herd or raise show or production animals for those qualities that you're looking for when you're talking about EPDs. So if you're going to AI um, your heifer, if you're gonna AI your you, um, you know, your guilt, if you're gonna AI any of those animals, you wanna look at these EPDs before you're buying um, semen. So you wanna, you know, do you wanna raise your next show animal? You wanna look at um, the qualities that you want in your next show animal. And so this is a great opportunity if you're interested in going um, the next level with your show animals and um, starting to raise your own. The other portion that you can use it with is EPDs are being brought into livestock judging because we're trying to mirror what the industry is doing. And so if you're interested in competing in livestock judging, which I think is great um, for any of, you, any of you that are really passionate about the livestock industry, livestock judging is um, a great pathway for you to continue on. There are collegiate teams, collegiate scholarships, a lot of national opportunities. So a few opportunities that are here in the state is with Arizona Na National Livestock Show. Um, the livestock judging, you will see EPDs used um, for classes there. The same with the Skillathon. The Skillathon sometimes has scenarios where they give you EPDs. And just like today, you have to identify um, which animal you would like to select based on the scenario. And there, you can even talk about EPDs in the poster contest or the prepared public speaking contest. There's a lot of contests at Arizona National Livestock Show um, that you should get involved in. It's in our backyard and it's a national opportunity. And then the other um, portion I wanna talk about is Western National Roundup. We do take a team of Arizona 4-Hers to Western National Roundup to compete in livestock judging. And so this will really help you prepare for that next level. And then it looks like I might have um, a comment. How, how do we do this skill fun and what's involved? That's a really good question. So um, you can email me for more information and let me put this in there, but the skill thon is a great way to showcase your life, livestock knowledge. So there is a section based on tools. So it'll be um, different tools that you have to identify. There is a meat section, a breed section, and then there is a scenario section. It's just a really great opportunity um, to put all of your knowledge um, to the test. And it's a lot of fun. And if you're interested, just make sure to shoot me an email and I'll get you some more information. And then the last thing I want to hit on is don't forget this goes into your record book as a state activity. So make sure you're putting these um, ag at home webinars in your record book because it's great to showcase what you've been doing and involved in even from the comfort of your own home. And that is all I have. Are there any questions? Well, that was great. I am so happy to learn so much more. I knew some of this stuff, but not a lot. Any questions for Ashley? I think she did a great job. And also our other Ashley, we've got lots of Ashleys on, uh, put in the chat the link to the evaluation. So please fill that out. And our presenter, Ashley, put in her email if you want more information on that. Last chance for questions or comments. I think it was pretty useful. I know which bull I would choose. It was, I got the right answer. <laughs> good, good. I know when, um, when my husband made this scenario, I'm like, okay, I need to look at it to make sure I could get the right answer. And I got it too. So I felt pretty good. <laughs> so what did you guys all think about this? Give us a, you fill out your evaluations, but also just give us something that you learned in the chat, something that you didn't know that you found really interesting about this. Oh. So, so horse judging, I'll answer that. Horse judging okay. is next on May. I put it, just put it in the questions. <clears throat> um, doo -doo -doo. On June 3rd is horse judging. And then the next date, and there's that link, which you can find, Ag at Home, which you guys have been to to register each time is in the chat and you can find all the other ones. The dairy one will be the next one. And the next one after that will be the working dogs. 
And as we go into live and slow down on webinars, we will just go from there. But so why in four weeks instead of two? Because you guys are starting to have live activities and we're seeing a lot fewer attendees. So we're just phasing down as we phase up the in-person stuff, which is really cool and exciting for us. All right, Kaylee knew nothing and she was giving you some really good solid answers. So that's awesome. Yeah, and I should end with um, thanking all of you guys who participated in the chat. I really appreciate it. It really helps out the Zoom presenter when people are um, really interactive in the chat. So thank you to everyone who answered my questions in there. I really appreciate it. All right. And I guess if that's all we have, thank you so much for attending. And we'll go ahead and let you guys sign off and our couple of panelists will finish our details after the fact. Thanks so much. Thanks for joining us. Bye, everybody.